All right, aloha, good morning. It really is great to see so many of you, even some friends I haven't seen in like four years, just pop in from the mainland and surprise us, which is fun. So my name is Scott. For those of you who are guests, it's my privilege to be the lead pastor here at International Church, where together we aim to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. Now, the highlight of my 2021 so far uh, happened a few weeks ago when my sister was visiting. She and I got to go flying at sunrise with Abby Dang. If you don't know Abby Dang, that was the wonderful lady playing the piano up here. And it was incredible. We took off uh, just before dawn. That had to be taken like with the flash. Uh, took off just before dawn, and we headed up the center of the island. Just this, the sun was rising. We turned around the north shore. It was awesome. We had, uh, there's a picture, I think that's about Pupukea area, as you looked to the east. Uh, then we headed down the east coast, you know, seeing Kava Valley, the Jurassic Park. Uh, we even flew over my house in Kaneohe so I could wave at my kids and they could wave up at me, uh, just in case we didn't see each other ever again. Then uh, we went past uh, Lanai, or not Lanai, that would have been cool. Uh, we went past Kailua uh, and Lanikai on our way to Molokai. Uh, and Abby did an excellent job. There's actually a bunch of cloud cover. She maneuvered it expertly. We went around and saw the Kalaupapa uh, Kalau sea cliffs, which I did not know were the tallest sea cliffs in the world. 3,300 feet down, that's over 1,000 meters or kilometer, for those of you who use the metric system, which makes more sense. Alas, get sidetracked here. Uh, then we circled around all of Molokai and came back to Oahu. It was gorgeous, landed at uh, Barber's Point. It was beautiful, it was tremendous, uh, definitely a memory that will last a lifetime. I think that's a photo from, took right over Lenny Kai. Uh, that was the water, and those are some little boats out there. Now, here's a picture of the airplane that we were in. Now, I'll be honest, I knew the airplane wasn't going to be huge. I knew it was going to be small. But as we walked up to it, um, suddenly we were there. <laughs> it's like, it's not further in the distance, it's right here in front of us. And I noticed as my head pretty much hit the wing, now, I'm only like 6'1". I'm not a ginormous person, but I'm also not small. But the airplane, did I say the airplane was small? <laughs> now, uh, I, of course, the thought goes through my mind, like, is this going to work? <laughs> like, is this thing really going to keep me in the air? Is this going to stay in the air? Now, I have that same thought when I step on a, a 777 uh, as well. Don't, don't get me wrong. Like, this isn't a, a fear of flying thing. I love flying. When I was a kid, I seriously considered becoming a pilot. But I think there's just kind of this natural concern when you step onto a, you know, iron dragon that's going to keep you in the air. You go, this is going to work, right? Like, this giant 777, like, really? This is going to stay in the air the whole time. Now, I understand the basic physics, something about thrust needing to, you know, exceed drag, lift needing to exceed the force of gravity. I understand that if the air pressure underneath the plane is greater than what's above the plane, it'll fly. I understand that. It still feels weird. It feels unbelievable at times. But if you want to fly, that's the price of flight, right? Right? And we certainly want to fly. There's a lot of benefits that come from it. Within hours, you can be anywhere in the world. We want the benefits of fast and rapid travel. But if you want to fly, you can't just do it any old way that you want to. You have to go about it a certain way. There are laws of nature that need to be followed, that, that cannot be disregarded. If you want to fly to the mainland, you have to get in the plane. You can't just walk off the poly, jump off, and start flapping your arms. You're not going to make it all the way to the mainland. You just can't do it any old way you want to. You've got to go about things the right way. You've got to go and work within the boundaries of laws that God has created. If you want the blessings of flight, the benefits of flight, you have to do it within God's boundaries. Now, that principle translates to life pretty well too. You see, everybody's looking to fly. Every, everybody wants the good life. Everyone wants a blessed life. Now, we might have some different views of what that means to us personally, 
but we all want to experience the, the good life, and we want to get there quickly. Now, what's amazing about our God is that God actually wants that for you, too. God's not sitting up there going, blessed life, are you kidding me? No way, I don't want that for you. No, he wants you to have a blessed life. He wants to give his blessings to you, but you can't just have his blessings in any old way, shape, or form. You can't just go about your life and expect God to bless you. You can't just go jumping off the polys of life, flap your arms, and expect things to go well. God does want to bless you, but he's going to bless you within the boundaries and the confines of the world and the history that he has created, that he has established. The good life is found the way he says it is found. It exists a certain way. Now, what is that way? How do you access that? Well, that's exactly what the Apostle Peter talked about in Acts chapter 3. That's what we're going to see this morning. If you have a Bible, a hard copy or screen or otherwise, I invite you to turn there with us this morning. We're in a sermon series through the book of Acts called The Movement Begins. Now, Acts records for us the early days of Christianity. A historian and doctor named Luke wrote down everything that happened. And we're looking at how God launched this movement called the church out into the world. Because we need to understand the church is a movement. The church is not ultimately a building. The church is not a worship service. The church is the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God to go out and live on a mission for God. So last week, you may remember, those of you here, here, we read the first part of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, which tell us about the healing of a lame man. And when God brought this lame man to Jesus, this hurting man, sorry, to Peter, when God brought this hurting man to Peter, Peter brought Jesus to him. And the man was instantly healed. He jumped to his feet, started jumping, dancing around. He's hanging on John and Peter, and he went into the temple with them, running, jumping, and praising God. That, in turn, starts to draw a crowd, right? The, the crowd starts to recognize this guy. We're like, wait, isn't this the lame man who normally begs outside the temple all the time? What's he doing walking and jumping? What has happened here? Clearly, something big is going on. They're stunned by this. They see the man healed. They see he's, he's happy. He's joyful. He's living the good life now. And they want to know, whoa, 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 how did this happen? Maybe it's because they want to get in on that action a little bit. Maybe they're like, whoa, 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 what's the, what's the key here? What's the source? What's the secret sauce? Can, can I get some of that? Can I have some of that healing in my life? Can I have some of this joy and dancing and praising of God in, in my life? I, I think they're probably after some of that miracle, some of that power, some of that healing, some of that blessing for their own lives. Now, Peter's going to tell them that they're going about that the wrong way. They're looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. But if they truly want a blessed life, a changed life, a better life, they can get it. And he's going to tell them where to look. He's going to tell them they need to look upward, inward, forward, and backward. Now, I'm going to read through this whole text. And then we'll unpack what Peter said together. So just stick with me through the speech. I'll read from Acts 3, 11 down to 26. It says, While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Now when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. 
But this is how God fulfilled what he'd foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, as all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So Peter starts off by saying, (laughs) whoa, guys, why are you looking at me and John like I'm Superman and he's Harry Potter? I'm not powerful and his spells are terrible. We, we don't have any special power. We don't have any secret sauce here that, that is in us. We did not heal this man. If you're looking to us for healing, you're looking in the wrong place. Instead, you need to look upward. God is the one who has done this, and he has done it through his Messiah, Jesus. It's really pretty impressive. I mean, Peter and John, they don't brag about what just happened. They don't post about it on Facebook. They don't make an Instagram post. Be like, oh my gosh, we just had the most amazing Sunday. And try to get more and more likes and get you to share. That's not what they did. They tried to deflect the attention away from themselves. And away from there, like, hey, we didn't do this. They didn't go, well, it's because we have this really great quiet time. It's because I have this really awesome book that you should buy. Uh, it, it was none of that. They just said it was, it was Jesus. It wasn't us. They put the spotlight on Christ. He gets the attention. Now, why Jesus? What's so special about him? Well, Peter explains to his audience that God, the Jewish God of their ancestors, because he's talking to people in Jerusalem, to the inhabitants there, to Jews. He says, look, this is your God. This is Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has chosen to work through Jesus. He says, God has glorified his servant Jesus. That's verse 13. That's like his, his main sentence, his topic sentence. God has glorified his servant Jesus. What does that mean? Why is that significant? Well, this is a significant allusion to an Old Testament passage, a famous, well-known Old Testament passage that almost all Jews could have maybe even recited from memory. It's a passage in the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 53. It's the only other part in the entire Bible where the words servant and glorified are used together. So he's talking about Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 talked about this suffering servant in this passage that many of you will know. We don't have time to kind of dissect all of Isaiah 53, but I do want to go back and highlight a few of the verses because this is background information that the Jewish audience would have had that most of us don't necessarily think about when we read this passage, but it underpins what he is saying. It's pretty foundational to understand his message about Jesus. So when Peter's referencing Isaiah 53, he's referencing this passage, which reads, he, speaking of this suffering servant, was despised and rejected by humankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. 
and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divine the spoils of the strong, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, Peter's point in referencing that is goes, hey, that suffering servant, that Messiah figure that we have been waiting for, this Messiah, the servant, is going to suffer and somehow remove people's sins. Yeah, that suffering Messiah is Jesus. All right, he's the Messiah that God had promised 700 years ago through Isaiah to send. He's the one who would die and would be raised back to life. He's the one who would save God's people from their sins by taking the sins upon himself. And Isaiah predicted, after he suffered and died, he would see the light of life again. He would be raised back. Peter's going, look, the clues were there all along. Isaiah 53 points to what you're seeing and what you're experiencing. This servant would be given majesty and honor and glory and power. He would rule over all. So, Peter even goes a step further then in the next portion. He says, hey, Jesus is that glorified servant. And then he goes on to call Jesus the author of life whom you killed, the holy and righteous one whom you rejected. Those terms, holy and righteous one, author of life, those were terms in the Old Testament that were only used for God. So Peter here is equating Jesus as being the Messiah and as being God in the flesh. And he says, this this is the only reason why. This is why Jesus has the power to heal, the power to uh, do what he does, to respond to people who come to him through faith, not through power, not through spells, but through faith, the power, the might, the glory, the redemption of Jesus. The blessings of God are distributed by Jesus through faith. That's why Peter says real clearly, verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. So Peter is directing their attention upward toward God, toward Jesus, saying it wasn't us, it was Jesus. Jesus who lived, who was crucified and who resurrected, he is God's Messiah. He is God. Jesus is the source of all the blessings. Jesus is the source of the good life. He's the source of of healing. Isaiah 35 talked about how the lame would be leaping for joy when the Messiah came. Here it is, this lame man leaping for joy. This miracle is proof of it. Guys, there's no secret sauce. It's just Jesus. Do people ever ask you for your secret sauce? Maybe if you're, you know, a really good chef, but that's not what I mean. I mean the sauce of life. Does anyone ever ask you what your secret is? Does anyone ever ask you, what makes you live the way you do? What makes you different to others? Does your life cause people to wonder what you have and how they could have it too? Is your joy infectious? Is your love evident? Is your hope unwavering, even in the midst of suffering? Is your faith real? Does your life ever demand an explanation from anybody? When I think about lives that demand an explanation, one of the people that come to mind is a guy named George Mueller, or Müller, for those of the Germans out there. Now, Fiona's actually been reading a biography about George Mueller to our girls uh, in the homeschool, and I've kind of been catching some of it, too, and it's a really incredible story. I encourage you to look up this man's life. I can only give you a brief snippet of it this morning, but George Mueller was a pastor in the 1800s. He was born in 1802 in Bristol, England. Now, one day, as a pastor, he decided to start an orphanage. He was burdened by all the the children that he saw in the city that had no parents. So he started an orphanage. Now, did he do this primarily because he had a heart for these orphans? Though I'm sure he did have a heart for them, that wasn't the main reason he started the orphanage. That's not what he says. 
In fact, he gave a different primary motivation. He wrote this in his journal. He said, if I, a poor man, simply by prayer and faith obtained without asking any individual the means for establishing and carrying on an orphan house, then there would be something which with the Lord's blessing might be instrumental in strengthening the faith of the children of God, besides being a testimony to the consciences of the unconverted of the reality of God. He goes on to say, this then is the primary reason for establishing the orphan house. The first and primary object of the work was and is that God might be magnified by the fact that orphans under my care provided for all that they need only by prayer and without anyone being asked by me or my fellow laborers, whereby it may be seen that God is still faithful. Okay, old English. What is that? What's he saying? He's saying, I'm going to start an orphanage and I'm going to ask zero people for zero dollars. I'm just going to pray. When I need something, I'm going to pray. And if God provides for this orphanage and for the orphans, then it will have to be proof and evidence that he is good, that he is faithful, that he is alive. Surely, as Christians hear of this, their faith will be strengthened. And as non-Christians see this, it will be a testimony to them of the reality of God. They won't be able to deny it. Something here is different. What is it? And for more than 60 years, George and his wife ran the orphanage, saving and serving over 10,000 children, never asking anyone for a penny. He ran it all on faith. When he was in need, he just prayed. And God was faithful, miraculously providing for them at times in just bizarre means. Here, I'll give you one example. One morning, he heard that there was absolutely no food anywhere in the kitchen. They were out. They had no food or drink for the kids. So he turned to his young daughter, Mary, and said, Mary, let's see what God is about to do. And he called all 300 children in the orphanage at that time, together brought them into the dining hall, and said, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the food that we are about to eat. And he told the kids to sit down. And they all looked around, <laughs> shuffled. So they eventually, after chairs moving and shaking, there was quiet as they all sat before empty plates and cups. And as soon as it was quiet, there was a knock at the door. And as they opened the door, the local baker was standing there, saying, Mr. Mueller, I don't know what was going on last night, but I couldn't sleep a wink. And the whole night, God told me, I need to get up and make you guys bread. So I got up at 2 in the morning, and I've baked dozens of loaves of bread. Is there any way you could use that? While the baker is talking, the milkman walks up and goes, Mr. Mueller, you wouldn't believe it. I, my milk wagon just broke down around the block. Now, I can fix it, but not with all the milk on it. I need to move all the milk off, and it's going to spoil if I just leave it here. Could you use an entire milk wagon of milk? And he instructed the kids to go out and get all the bread and all the milk. It's incredible, right? Now, why did Mueller do things this way? Was it to show off his faith? No. No. It was to show off the might and power of God. He did this so that when people asked, Mr. Mueller, how is this possible? How did this happen? The answer could only be, look upward. Jesus did it. He did it through the faith and prayers of his people. It's that simple. Jesus is the source of blessing for this ministry and for these children. See, George Mueller wanted people to ask questions. And to look upward for the answers. Do you share that burden too? Do you have that desire? Does your life ever defy natural explanation? Are you living in light of the Holy Spirit's ability to transform a person completely and entirely? Are, are you living proof of the gospel? And when you have that opportunity, do you point people upward for the answer? Does your faith cause people to wonder and give you the opportunity to say, Jesus did it? People asked Mueller, 
People ask the lame man. Does anyone ever ask you? Does anyone ever ask me for the hope that we have? And if not, why not? I think it's a question worth pondering for believers. So Peter begins his sermon by telling them, you guys got to look upward. Jesus is the source of what's going on. God is the source of all of this. He's the source of blessing. But then he directs them to look inward. They look upward, and then they suddenly need to look inward. Why? Because looking up at Jesus immediately creates a problem for these inhabitants of Jerusalem. Because if Jesus really is the Messiah, he really is God, having come in the flesh, then they're in big trouble. Because this is the Jesus they crucified a few weeks ago. This is the Jesus they loudly voted for death for him. This is the Jesus they shouted that his blood would be on them and on their children. As Peter so succinctly and eloquently says, you killed the author of life. That's a problem. Because they rejected Jesus, that shows their guilt before God. That's guilty of of serious sin. They rebelled against him in, in the worst possible way by disowning him and killing him. But that doesn't just create a problem for this crowd of Jews. This is an issue for Gentiles too, for non-Jews. Peter actually emphasizes this in Acts chapter 10 when he's talking to a completely Gentile audience. He goes, hey, the Gentiles rejected Jesus too. The Gentile leaders condemned him as well. There is not a group or a person that has a moral leg to stand on before God. We have all rejected him. We've done it in different ways in our lives. We've rejected his authority over us. We've declared our independence from him. We've wanted to live our life our own way. That is sin. And sin puts us at odds with a perfect and holy and just God. When you reject the author of life, what do you have left but death? And that is a choice that we have all made with our sin, with our rebellion against God. And that's a really big problem. See, it is impossible to look upward to see the the glory and the majesty and the holiness of Jesus Christ and not immediately feel some sense of despair. Because knowing inwardly, we're nothing like him. We are not him. There's a massive gulf between who Jesus is and who I am. How can I ever be reconciled with God? That's where Peter introduces some amazingly good news. That's where the gospel comes in. The gospel is, simply just means good news. The good news that we were sinners who rejected God over and over in our lives. We've sinned against him. We've gone our own way. We even rejected his son whom he sent to save us. But God showed himself to be far more powerful than our sin. God is more powerful than evil. His mercy is greater than our rejection. His grace can conquer death. And so it is actually by our rejection of him that he goes and saves us. He overcomes even that, that he places on himself, on his son, the sins of the world. And in Christ's death, he takes our place. He becomes the the sacrifice on our behalf. He atones for our sin. God, when Jesus is on the cross, does this great exchange where our sin, our stain, our filth gets put on him. And his righteousness, his innocence, his beauty, his perfection gets credited to us. He gets rid of it. That's what Isaiah 53 was talking about. When explained that this servant would die, but this servant would do so willingly. And by his death, he would save us. We were pierced, uh, he'll be pierced for our transgressions. He'll be crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace with God is on him. By his wounds, we are healed. That's the amazing good news. 
that this Jesus, the author of life, whom we have all rejected, has come to save us. He's come to heal us. He's come to wipe away our sins. Jesus has come to bless you. Despite your rejection of him, despite your rebellion, despite maybe your indifference toward him, going, Jesus, who even cares? Why am I even here? Yeah, he came even despite that to bless you, to give himself to you. He comes after you with love and grace and mercy. See, God wants to bless you in Christ. That is where God blesses you his people. The good life, my friend, that you are ultimately searching for, that's going to be full of meaning, that's going to last, that's going to be permanent, can only be found in Jesus Christ. You cannot access God's eternal blessings in any other way. He is the path to healing. He is the way to wholeness. He's the road to everlasting life. A blessed life that's going to matter for eternity is never going to be found in money or fame or power or family or reputation or the admiration of others or in sexual fulfillment or in achievements or in possessions. True eternal blessing and healing is found only in Jesus As we sang earlier, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And friends, the good news is God wants to bless you. He's not trying to keep it from you. He's not trying to hide it from you. He's just telling you there's a way to access it. There's a way to access his blessing and his healing. If you want to have it, it's through Christ. Okay, now how do we do that? How do we gain access to this eternal blessing in Christ? Well, Peter tells him in verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It's repentance. Repent. That just means to turn away, to turn away from sin and to turn toward God. To turn away from self-seeking and to turn towards seeking him. To turn away from independence and to instead choose dependence. Recognizing that we've always been dependent for every breath in every moment. We repent and we turn to God and say, forgive me. I put my faith in Jesus. Repent and turn to God. That's what he says. And your sins will be wiped out. It is simple. But it isn't easy. It is actually difficult because it requires a lot of humility. It requires a choosing to die to self and and to doing life our own way. It means giving up our perceived freedom. And I say perceived freedom because we aren't really free. The Bible says you're not free. You're enslaved to yourself. You're enslaved to your selfishness. You're enslaved to your sinful desires. You're not free. You don't have any choice but to do what is good for you. You're enslaved to that. See, sin is is like gravity that's pulling us down. And God wants us to fly, but we have to do so by getting into his airplane, by boarding the aircraft of Jesus Christ by faith. Anything else is jumping off the poly and flapping your arms. Christ and faith in him is the way we gain access to eternal life. Freedom comes from flying according to his rules. The blessings come in boundaries. The boundary of God's full and eternal, rich love and blessing is the boundary of Christ. God wants to bless you in Christ. And how do you access that blessing? It's through repentance, through putting your faith in him. Now, Peter is really trying to communicate this in a very positive way. He's saying the Lord wants to bless you. The Lord wants to refresh you. The Lord wants to wipe away your sins. wants to heal you. He speaks in very positive terms. But he also, in verse 23, is willing to issue a warning. He's willing to say that those who ignore Jesus, who disregard this prophet who Moses had predicted would be greater than he, 
that anyone who ignores Jesus will have no part in God's redemption. They will not be part of his people who are saved from sin and death. Because it's a choice to either board the aircraft of Christ or to not. So my friend, let me ask you this morning, have you done this? Have you repented? Have you turned to God and asked for his forgiveness for sin? Have you received his refreshing and his blessing? He wants to give that to you. He does not want it to pass you by. He wants to give you that gift. He wants to bless you eternally with forgiveness, with peace with himself, with fellowship, with eternal life. He wants to refresh you, renew you, and reset your life, just like he did for the lame man. But you must repent in order to be restored into that relationship with him. And you can do that today. You can do that right now. Wherever you are, whoever you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what, what your history is, there's forgiveness in Christ. You simply call out to him. In your mind, in your heart, he hears, he knows, he sees. You say, God, I, I repent, I turn from my sin, I turn to you. Save me, rescue me. And if you do that, or if you've ever done that in the past, then Ephesians 1.3 says that God now blesses you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. He says that God will not hold back from you any good thing. He unleashes it all upon his people in Christ. And that counts not only for this life, but also for the life to come. You see, there is a life that is to come. Jesus is proof of that. He didn't stay dead. He was resurrected. Isaiah 53 said, you won't stay dead. He would be given new life. He then ascended to the Father, where Peter says in verse 21, that heaven had to receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. You see, here Peter is now taking the audience's attention, and he wants them to now look forward, to look toward the future. All right, first he said, look upward to Christ. Look inward, repent, and now look forward. Guys, there will be a time when God will restore all things. When the fullness of healing and blessing, which is, this is just a shadow of, is going to come. This life is not all there is, which is why the things of this world and this life can never ultimately satisfy. The, the full experience, the full blessed life, that kind of eternal value and meaning that every human soul is longing for, eternity in our hearts can only be found in Jesus. Through him, we gain access to that new creation where we will have perfect lives, perfect bodies, where, where Jesus says he's going to come back and restore this world to one that has no evil, no sin, no decay, no brokenness. All things bad will come untrue someday. The new heavens, the new earth, they await us in the future. It's his promise. The refreshing has just begun. Jesus is going to make all things new. He has already begun to make all things new. He is starting with the hearts and spirits of humankind. He's inaugurated the new creation already. This miracle is proof of that. The miracle of a changed life is proof of that. And one day he'll come back to finish the whole job to consummate what he has started. See, Peter's explaining, look, this miracle, this guy getting healed, it's really like all miracles. It's not really about the here and the now, right? That guy ended up dying. We talked about that last week. It's always been about pointing forward. Every miracle is about pointing forward to the time when that will be the norm, when we won't be needing miracles anymore because it will have be, all be done all the miracles will have been done. The blessings and joys that we receive in this life are great, but they are a shadow of the blessings and the joy in the life that is to come. God will bless you in Christ. 
Anyone who is in Christ will experience eternity with him. The future is bright for those who will turn from their sin and turn to God. For those who put their faith in Jesus, the Bible says all God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So Peter wants them to think about that, to recognize eternity. And the final move that he makes in this persuasive speech to the Jews is to tell them, guys, all of this makes sense if you'll just look backward. If you'll just look at the history of Israel. If you'll just go back and search again the scriptures. See, our prophets have told us about this over and over again. He tells them, Jesus has been prophesied about, starting with Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. All the way through, through Samuel, through Isaiah, all of them point up to this moment, he says, up to the time of the coming of the Messiah. God is keeping every one of his promises. He's not going to let a single one fall to the ground. They are all yes in Christ. The Messiah is here to heal and to restore, to forgive and to save, to bless and to refresh. So despite their unfaithfulness to him, like you didn't know what you were doing. You were blinded by sin. God still loves you. God still loves Israel. This is why he says God's bringing this gospel message to them first. They got dibs. They're on the inside track. They're heirs of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. They have the inside track over people who don't know God, have never heard of Yahweh before. This is kind of a foreshadowing, too, that, hey, this is coming to you first, but this message is not just going to stay in Jerusalem. This message in Acts is going to go all over the world. It is going to go out to Gentiles as well. This is going to be a universal offer of salvation, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles, too. What he's saying here kind of reminds me of, of a passage in Romans 1.16, where Paul writes that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And I am so thankful for that reality. I am so grateful that Jesus came to save all people, not just those who knew and worshipped Yahweh in the past. All are invited in John 3, that famous passage in verses 16 and 17, contains this good news that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, will have the blessings. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God is not here to ruin your life. God wants to bless you, but he's going to save you and bless you through Jesus. In other words, God wants to bless you in Christ. So have you believed in him? Have you repented and trusted him? If not, know that this invitation, this 2,000-year-old invitation is still going out today. It's still good. It's still valid. It's still an option for you. I think if you, too, would also look backward, you might see that your whole life has led up to this moment. If you've never trusted him, maybe you can look back at your life, though, and you can see that, hey, God's been calling out to me all along. Maybe you just weren't listening. Maybe you were running from him. Maybe you just didn't hear. But if you hear him today, you can repent and come home today. He will forgive your sins. He'll refresh and restore your life by the power of the Spirit. So I encourage you, do that today. You don't know if you'll have tomorrow, but you have today. You have right now. Now, for those of you who already have made that decision, which I know is a number of you, then know this. You are blessed by God. He has given you everything in his son. So don't go looking for it elsewhere. Don't be flapping your arms off the poly, thinking that somehow money or fame or reputation or sex or power, anything else is going to give you something that's better than Jesus. It's not. In Christ, you have all you need for life and godliness. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is yours in Christ. I just want to remind you of that. 
I'm not telling you anything you don't know. My main job as a lead pastor, you'd be like, man, Scott, say something new. I don't have anything new. My job is mostly I'm the reminder in chief around here. I'm reminding you of things you already know. Go back to the gospel every day. Go back to the gospel. Dig deeper roots. Grow taller branches. But don't move on from it. I just want to encourage you to remember this and to allow that memory to spark gratitude in you. Gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. Because I'm not here to guilt you and to, hey, go live your life better so people ask you about it. That's not going to work. That's going to last a day, maybe two. But if you will look at the gospel and allow it to remove a response of joy and gratitude in you, that you will not be able to contain, my friend. So just focus on the cross. If you're like, I'm not grateful, well, then you need to just refocus. Maybe you need to be reminded of what God has done for you. I want to be like this lame man who, who responds to what Christ has done for him with jumping, with, with praising, worshiping God, with joy and abandon, going, I don't know, it was Jesus. Talk to these guys. I want to be grateful for what God has done for me in Christ. I hope you do too. So remember it. Be awed by it. Let it stir your affections toward praise. Don't, don't, don't let familiarity inoculate you to the real power of the gospel. Don't let a little bit of knowledge about it inoculate you to the real powerful thing. Keep digging deeper. Now, one way that Christians have been remembering and celebrating and causing ourselves to remember and to worship Jesus for what he's done has been through communion. This is something the church has been celebrating for thousands, to over 2,000 years almost, ever since Jesus left. For those of you who are in person today, we have the communion elements in front of you on the chair. If you're joining us at home, you're welcome to pause this video. That'll work. Uh, if you want to go get any juice or wine or crackers or bread ready and join us, we invite you to do that. See, these elements are a memorial to us of what Jesus has done and of what Jesus will do for us. They remind us of how blessed we already are, and they actually remind us of the great blessings that are still to come in the future. The bread and the juice, they proclaim the gospel message. Jesus gave his body, gave his, his blood as a ransom for our sins. He rescued us from sin. He rescued us from death. How? By enduring and destroying sin and death. And as we taste the elements, we're reminded of that sacrifice in the past, right? The, the price that he paid for our blessed freedom. But as we taste the elements, we also recall his promise to one day return and to consummate all things, to restore everything, Peter says. God will come to complete the restoration that he has began. We will reign with him forever in the new heavens, in the new earth. What an amazing blessing that will be too. So let's partake of the elements together. The, there's a little film on top that gives you access to the wafer. This is for anyone who's a believer in Christ. I invite you to join us. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your everlasting love. From eternity past, Lord, you have been so good and you have been so faithful. 
And you have shown such love and mercy and patience toward us sinful humans. Lord, you have blessed us abundantly, more than we could ever understand or imagine in your son, Jesus. We thank you that he has taken our sins upon himself. We thank you, Lord, that anyone who repents, anyone who trusts in him can be saved. Lord, if there's anyone listening to this who's who's resisted you up until now. May that change today. May they look upward and inward, forward and backward, and just see the gospel clearly as they look. May they repent and turn to you, Jesus. Lord, for those of us who have believed and continue to believe, would you help us continue walking in the grace of the gospel that we have known from the beginning? Help us to grow deep roots. Help us to grow tall branches in Christ. And Lord, if it be your will, indeed, allow our lives to be witnesses to the blessed life that we have in Christ. And when people ask, we can point them to you. And when people ask, Lord, keep us humble and keep us grateful. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.